children can be raised. God expect us to partner with Him. God expect us to be involved actively in raising our children. It is practically impossible to train and raise godly seed without following divine guidance and divine guidelines. Why it is impossible, almost, it almost impossible to raise a godly child without having God and the guidelines of God guiding that child. It is also imperative for the divine God to find a righteous and godly couple to raise dynamic and God-honoring children. Both are important. God on one hand and we humans on the other hand. The divine on one hand and we mortal on the other hand. The infinite God with his wisdom on one hand and we were finite mortal men of yesterday on the other hand. Our partnership together is what made us to produce godly children. Abraham needed divine directives and scriptural parental principles to raise godly Isaac. When you look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, they also received divine visitation coupled with their parental dexterity to produce righteous and God-fearing John the Baptist. Manoah and his wife, in Judges 13, they needed both supernatural revelation from God and also, and on the other hand, the beautiful parental guidance to raise godly somewhere. Both are important. You cannot raise successfully, not even in this culture, not in this system that is so perverse and is anti-God to the core, without God in your life and without the principle of the scriptures guiding you. That's why today, we'll look at this in there. As we look at the partnership God expects us to have in raising godly children. Even those of us who have them grown up, God still has something for us. Our grandparents who are here, don't close up, God still has something for us. And for our children, and for those of our brethren who are in the, in the time of procreating children, producing by the grace of the Lord, God has something for us. And specifically to this family, God has something for everyone. Look at three points as we look at this study together. Number one, divine pronouncement about our children's glorious destiny. As I read the scriptures, allow the Holy Spirit to interpret, explain the, what He has in mind for you in, this, in the service today. There are deep pronouncements by God upon the future of every child. Children in the Bible, they receive a divine pronouncement about our children go glorious destiny. The same thing God does today. For I am that God who have dedicated to the Lord today. And for the older children that God has given to all, there is a divine pronouncement that we need to understand and unravel by the grace of God. Number two, we're going to look at definite prescription for our children guidance development. How do we successfully raise children? How do we, how can we be guided for the development of our boy today and all our children together by the grace of God? There are definite prescriptions for our children guidance development. We're going to round up the time for me, devoted partnership for our children glorious dominion. Daddy and mommy, what kind of partnership should we have? husband and wife, what kind of arrangement should we have to raise children who will dominate in the land, children who will lead, who will outlive us and they will outshine us and will go beyond the border of where we are ending. We need devoted partnership for children glorious dominion. Number one is divine pronouncement about our children glorious destiny. You find that in that passage where in Psalm 127, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain the beauty. And it gone to the next said, children are the heritage of the Lord. God Almighty 
I ask this to say about every child. Listen to me, Joe. Every child is number one, God's heritage. He belongs to God. She belongs to God. You are just a caretaker. You must let that on the let that sink into our mind. When God are wanting to take over the ownership of that child, you can't say, God, take your hand off. You can't say, God, my children, no. I block God away. I block the divine away. I block this boy being useful in the kingdom of God. If you do that, you are actually flouting God's direct instruction. Children are God's everything. Number two, they are God's heir. The heir of God. Just like we are joint ears with Christ. Children are God's heir. He, he, he treasure them. He loves them. He delights in them. He relishes them. Just like in our culture here. You'll find that culture that children are, 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 are raised to the next level. Everyone you get to, when they come, you always see them smiling at children. Because our society is rooted in scripture. And God's fall and fear and, and desire for children. They are God's care. Number three, children, by the grace of God, they are God's high weapons. There is weapon. Weapon in your family. Weapon for breakthrough. Weapon for greater things. Weapon for mighty breakthrough in our life. Those of our aged parents who are here, if not for their children, we will fight for them to bring them to this country. How would they ever dream they will ever be here? Their children were their weapon that God used to ride on them, on the wing of their children, to come to a better land. To enjoy some better atmosphere in their own age. Children, they are God's eye weapon in the hands of the Almighty God. Number four, they are God's habitation. God inhabits them. God wants to use them as a vessel of honor, as an instrument to protect His glory and to show forth His wonders. Number five, they are God's hope for the future. Children, you know that people who say, well, when you come to church, they say, well, we don't care about children. They are just making noise. That church is hopeless. When you get to a family, that the family, you take care of the father, they take care of the husband, but they neglect their children, that family will be hopeless. When you come to a society that only talk about the senior citizens, and the special privileged children and the people in the land, the adult, the, the people have muscle who can grow up, but they neglect children. That society will end up hopeless. Because children, that is God's great hope for the future. To whom the great blessings of heaven can come upon the world. Number six, children, they are God's hand for tomorrow's wonders. The hand of God that produces the wonders of tomorrow. These children we see today, their generation, in the next 10 years, you see the amazing wonders that all of them will be able to manifest and, and demonstrate in the world today. Children, they are God's hands for tomorrow's wonders. And children, number seven, they are God's ambassadors of souls. God require them. God love them. God delight in them. And I want to use your child, your son, your daughter as harvesters of soul. And the promise God gave unto Eli, uh, uh, Zechariah and his, and his wife. We see that in Luke chapter 1 verse 16. Luke chapter 1 verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall lead turn to the Lord their God. What his own father cannot do. What his mother cannot do. God decided that John the Baptist will turn many unto the Lord. Children, brothers and sisters, the God's harvesters of soul. Each child, therefore, have a specific pronouncement from God towards realizing their God-ordained destiny. As we read your Bible, from Genesis down to the last book, Revelation, you come across the pronouncement God gave to some of those children. Can I run over this particular pronouncement as we pick these children one by one? You see, there was God's pronouncement upon Isaac's destiny. 
You find that in Genesis chapter 13. You're going to pay a lot of reading when you get back because if I read there, you will not finish the service of the three. Because we need to understand there's a lot God wants us to share together from His holy world. Genesis 13, verses 14 to 16. God told Abraham his father, In thy seed he shall be great. What was God's pronouncement upon Isaac? Greatness. Greatness that no other person can question. Greatness that no nation can go against. That in thy seed, Abraham, I see will come after you, shall all the nations of the world be blessed. God pronounced on, 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 on I see greatness. Number two, on Jacob and Esau. You are twin brothers. What was the divine pronouncement upon both of them for Isaac and their mother Rebecca? It was a divine preferment. God decided in his program, the younger I will extol above the older. The firstborn is a, will be great, but the younger brother is my choice one. I will bless Isa, but I will exalt and elevate. Jacob above and beyond. And go and read your Bible. They fulfill the divine pronouncement according to their destiny. You find of Moses' destiny. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, the Bible says the parent of Moses, they saw he was a proper child. He was a good child. They could see something in Moses. He was born in time of war. He was, he was born when the death sentence was passed upon the children of Israel that they should drown them in River Nine by King Pharaoh. But Moses was born. They saw it was a proper child. They didn't want that boy to die. They saw something. You know what they saw in his destiny? A distinguished and outstanding leader. Right from the time he was born, when he was just about less than three months, they could see that this boy the way he does, and the way, does, the way God is speaking to them, this one will not just be one of the wrong of the main. This one will not just be one who does the, 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 the planet have. He will be a distinguished and outstanding leader. That was the divine pronouncement that God gave concerning his destiny. How about Samson's destiny? In Judges chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible quickly revealed what the life of Samson would become to his father, Manuel, and his mom that this boy will be a mighty deliverer, an unconquerable champion. You see, ever before, all our children, we need to understand there is a pronouncement from God over every one of them. But we parents don't pay attention often. We parents just don't wait, I just get by like any other person. And this boy just came, and thank God, let's click bottles, let's say, close the room, let's say, rejoice, and all that. There's more to that. Every child born has a divine pronouncement attached to that child, attached to that girl, higher today, that we are dedicated to the Lord today. There is a pronouncement upon his life, and for something, he will be a mighty deliverer, an unconquerable champion, and no free stands to conquer him. No nation on earth will conquer him until he sold his own life into the hand of the devil. That's why it's important for understand the purpose of God for our children on Deborah, the poorer destiny. There was a pronouncement in Judges chapter 4, verses 4 to 8, that Deborah would be an uncommon judge, a unique prophetess for God. God told them all the men were being raised up as judges. He go to the time Deborah was born, God said, I can't find any man. Any boy who will beat this girl, she will be a judge, an uncommon one for that matter, a unique prophetess for God. And for the 40 years, Deborah reigned as prophetess in Israel. There was peace in the land, there was joy in the land, because she lived to fulfill the pronouncement of God for his life. On Samuel's destiny, what was God's pronouncement? That Samuel would be a classic prophet. A mighty spokesman for God. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. We read to us what God pronounced concerning Jeremiah. That Jeremiah will be God's messenger. Messenger from the womb. God's messenger. Messenger right from the womb. 
that God said, right from the moon, I have ordained you and made me a prophet over all nations. Not just one nation, multiple nations. And a, a Jeremiah lived to fulfill that prophecy in his life. May our children live to fulfill that prophecy in their lives in Jesus' name. For your child, there is a pronouncement from God upon that child. For your daughter, there is a pronouncement of God upon your daughter. And by the grace of God, you will discern, you will find out, and you will fulfill that pronouncement in Jesus' name. Now come to the big question. How do we know? How do we discern the voice of God? How can we identify what is our child God giving divine pronouncement for his, for his or destiny? I just mentioned six things. In my experience and by studying the scriptures, brothers and sisters, if you can pay attention to these few things, you will easily know where your child or your children will become alive. Right before they were born, before they ever become teenagers and anything, God will have revealed something to you about them. How does God do that? How do we know that? Number one, by prayers. As I am is dedicated to God and born, and all our children pray to God that God, how shall I order this child? That was the prayer of Manuel in Judges 13, verse 12. They pray. Oh God, someone, something is about to be born. How shall we order this child? By prayer, we can understand the comfort and the purpose of our child's life. And I pray in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27. For this child I prayed. And God had given me what I have petitioned him, I requested from him. They find out through prayer the purpose of God for their children. You know, there are people, we, we know when we, when we get people become pregnant in our face of war, it's a thing of joy, everybody bubble, everybody's happy, everybody do baby showers, everybody, but who cares about what that child will become? They don't pay attention. What is God, the ultimate giver, is talking about concerning this child? They don't know because they didn't know how to pray. But go pray. Lay hands upon that child in the womb. And begin to commit with that child. And begin to prophesy to that child. And you will see him. He will come out to become what God wants him to be. Or what are to be. Number one, we can know by prayers. Number two, by prophecy. By the prophetic revelation of scriptures. Samson was born by prophetic revelation. The child is coming. He will be a Nazareth from the womb. Resurrection must not come to touch his head. Touch his head. He will be great. When John the Baptist was about to be born, angel appeared to his father by prophecy. Your prayer is heard. And Elizabeth, your wife, will become a mother. And the child shall be like this, he will turn many unto righteousness by prophecy. How do you find out prophecy? Read scripture. The word of God reveal the prophetic declaration about your child. Hi, and the children that God has given for me, church, we are for signs and wonders. That's prophecy. If you can lay claim to that, God will fulfill. Joshua said, as for me and my house, my children and wife inclusive, we will serve the Lord. That was a prophecy. And they lay hold on those prophecies in their life. There could be a specific prophecy that God had revealed. Because maybe in a dream, maybe in a trance, maybe in a vision about what this child will become. We need to hear from God and follow that prophecy to the letter. What how can we know? What God is saying concerning our children. Number three, by personal names. By the names they bear. Today, I am a gift from God. By that name alone, you can know what God had in mind. Why he dropped that name in the heart of daddy, in the heart of mommy, for him. By that name, that look with. A, a famous warrior by that name alone. So when we know those names, what does that do? We will begin to prop in. 
We begin to, we don't tell a child that become a famous warrior, you will never make it. You are a dollar. You are a, you are a look backward. Look at what you got and begin to shout him down. No! You don't tell warriors that. You pump up warriors. You exalt warriors. You, you encourage warriors. You stand by the hand and say, you are going to win. You are able. You can conquer. Nothing can conquer you in life. Those are things that, by like those names, that we give to our children. May I tell you, Moses in Exodus chapter 2 verse 10 had a name. The name was not given by dad and mom. Remember, it was a time of war. They put him on the on top of river when the daughter of the king was about to burn. And it, she saw and carried Moses in a basket. And they said, Who will go? And the, the sister Miriam came and said, Can I go call your nurse? And went to call the mother. And after a while, in chapter 2 of Exodus, chapter 10, we find Pharaoh's daughter gave Moses, gave Moses that name. Moses. What's the meaning? Because I drew him out of the world. Have you studied the life of Moses? Everything about his life was about water. The miracles that God did mightily in his life will break him. The provision of the bitter water of Mara, turning into a sweet water for the children of Israel, water. Everything about his life, even the mistake that Moses made was about water. You see, there's much in the name. There's much in the name we give to our children. By those personal names, you find that those children will eventually lead out to fulfill their calling. Matthew 1, 21. And they shall call his name Jesus. What's the meaning? That will save his people from their sins. By the name they live, he will not be a politician. He will not be people in the street. He will not be a miscreant. He will be the savior of mankind by the name that we bear. We give to our children. That's why, brothers and sisters, the name you give your children, Godly name, righteous name. Go study about the character that God put in your mind to give those names. You'll find out, and that will help you to guide your son, to guide your daughter in the right path to fulfill his God-given destiny. Number one, by prayer we can know. Number two, by prophecy we can discover. Number three, by personal name we can know. Number four, by peculiar skills and God-given endowment. Each child is born with a divine skill. They call it talent. They call it special ability. Your child has one. Your daughter has one. I thought you would say amen. amen. You don't know because your eyes is closed. You have not studied that boy. That two year old. That one year old. One one and a half year old. When they pick some instrument of like this, and you are in the kitchen, and that boy with pieces the thing together, eh? Who made it? He just laughed and he ran away because he thought he was, he was coding. God is telling you this boy has something in his life. You go out for somewhere and your boy just step in, and when you are judging your mommy, you are looking at the boy just say, Can I just say and begin to say those things and other things and he begin to draw crowds and people begin to laugh at him. Say this boy has something in his life. That me, dad, mom, we don't have. Because God is revealing something. There's a peculiar endowment in this child. The peculiar skills that God had given to him to fulfill his God-given dream. For Joseph, what did he have? Just a bit to dream. That's what he had. And sometimes our children, they come like that. Then dad, dad, I had a dream. You know what to do is shout them down. Hey, go, 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 go. Is that your book? Go, 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 go read your book. Go watch the kids do whatever. Go do everything. We keep their zeal. We keep their skill. We keep their endowment. Because we are ignorant of what God is speaking to all to those children. For Joseph, it was just a dream. For Ruth, it was a caring and a compassionate heart. She cannot but love to care. And that was the key that God gave to Ruth. It was that key that opened the door. For root in the path of greatness. For David, what was it was ability to play on an art, ability to play instruments of music. That was what the Lord endowed them with. For Daniel, it was the wisdom 
beyond the ancient, the wisdom beyond the ancient people. And for others, there were other skills and ability that God had given to your children. Find out what that specific, peculiar skills and God given endowment that your boy, your daughter has. Number five, how do we know what our children are? Apart from that peculiar skill, number five, the proving ability. Ability to prove something. He said that, leave me alone. I want to try this thing. And you watch them with, them with guidance and they prove it through and through. They are proving ability. You find the Bible says first Samuel chapter 3 because of in verse 20, in verse 20 the Bible says all Israel don't know that God has chosen Samuel to be the prophet for the whole land. He's proving ability. When Jesus followed his mom to the temple at the age of 12, in Luke chapter 2, verse 40 to verse 51. The Bible says after three days. They returned, they couldn't find Jesus. They pretend. So they came back, they found them in the temple, discussing with the philosopher, with the Bible theologian, and they were amazed and astonished at the wisdom that Jesus had. The mother of he said, Why you we left you sorrowing? You left us said, Am I must I not be at my, my father's business? That shocked their father. They yeah, sorry get Joseph and Mary. The Bible says Mary kept those things in his heart, in her heart. The proving ability of Jesus. Our children are God giving them down. Number six, a potential ownership. The, sorry, the potentate ownership. Potentate. That's the name of the, the, the supreme monarch, the king of kings, that rule over the affairs of men. He owns them. He takes root of their lives. And it takes thought of every activity they do. Look at this, if you have never noticed this in Psalm 22, verse 10. In Psalms of David 22, the scripture says in verse 10, the potentate ownership. Psalm 22, verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God for my mother's pain. Right from the womb. This child, this person, was already cast on by God, devoted to God, to be used for God. We need to discover, may God open our eyes to see our children's calling and guide them to fulfill their God-given destiny in Jesus' name. Divine pronouncement, our children's God-given destiny. Number three, number two, is the definite prescription of children's guidance development. After we have designed, we have known for Hyam and the senior sisters and all the other children. We need God to help us. To truly make our children live out and fulfill their God-given destiny. We must learn and apply the principle of successful parenting from Bible characters. From Bible in itself, the Holy Bible, they have given us, I will mention 14 different principles. That's a prescription to guide our children in the right path. To guide iron in the right path. To guard Nako and Naki and all our other daughters and sons, all our boys and girls, grown up or young, in the right path. They God give us deep understanding in Jesus' name. The first one is 2 Kings chapter 4, because of that, you can write down verse 17 to 24. That is a careful and cautious tending. A careful and cautious tending. Tending to tend the child. Every child needs us to tend him or her. Carefully. Cautiously. In that passage, the Shunammite family, husband and wife, they waited for a long time before God gave them this wonderful son. After the son was born, both of them carefully and cautiously they guided this boy, they lead this boy. You can see the way they share. In the morning will be with mom, in the afternoon will be with his dad. They are fond of him. They were careful and they, they cautiously tended him, bended him, guided him in the right path. 
Every child needs you, mother, mommy, to be careful with them, to be cautious with them. At times you don't yell at them. At times you talk with them. At times to play with them. There are times to guide them when they make mistakes. Their children. The Shunammite couple principle. Careful and cautious standing. Number two is Jacob and Rachel principle. Charity. That's the principle there. Charity. It's found in Genesis chapter 37 in verse 3. The Bible says, Jacob loved Joseph. No, the Bible put the other one more than all the other children. Don't love one child above the other. Love of his mistake. So that we don't commit the same mistake that Jacob made. But the beautiful thing was that he loved Joseph. He must love every child. Charity. Our charity for our children form the foundation for their development in life. It will surprise you that people that know how to give back to children, they don't love those children. The children make a little mistake. The milk of kindness is dried up. They have told your child back, they soon forget. They begin to pounce on that child as if it's a, as if it's a terrorist. Charity. Charity goes a long way to mold and mend our children's lives. Many children today don't want to come back home. After leaving college, they go back to college, from college to another place, to their friend's house. Why? They don't see that love between dad and mom anymore. They see yelling. They see skizzing. They see pulling down syndrome. And because of that, you send a signal to those children. You come across some children in the church and say, I will never give up. I mean, I will never get married. Say, what? Don't say that. Don't say no. How? Because of the examples the child, the, the girl has seen, the boy has seen at home. Charity, brothers and sisters, is the bond of perfectness. We must love one another. And by the grace of God, love our children fondly by the power and the grace of God. Number three, Elikan and Anna principle. Communion and prayer. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, Anna prayed, for this child I prayed. Prayer must be a major power in our lives in raising our children. A child we never prayed for, how will you prosper? A child we never prayed for, how will you turn out to be godly? A child we never prayed for, how will it be what God wants it to be? Prayer in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night. When they are walking to their buses, prayer. When they go to the school, prayer. When they have exams, prayer. When they are going through some challenges in their head, prayer. We make prayer a pattern of life. Our children showering prayer on the day of their birthday. More than cake. I want to beg you, give them more prayers. What a celebration. Closing road and spending some money. Give them more prayers. Prayer work wonders. Above and beyond any earthly social. You celebrate with them. You buy everything for them. But back it all with consistent life of prayer. And you can have an principle. There's us communion. Number four, Mordecai principle. In Esther chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, you find constructive criticism. At times, you have to tell your child and sit him down, sit her down, and give her a kind of criticism that will not destroy his self esteem, that will not ruin his tenderness of his heart, but that will make him see reason in his mistakes, in his flaws, and now he needs to recover himself. Constructive, you find it in Mordecai and this girl, Esther. Esther lost her mother and his and her father. Mordecai, the uncle, took over to take care of this child. There was a bonding between them. When Esther said, I can't go to meet the king because it's contrary to the law. What did Mordecai say? Mordecai give up. You, are the, you don't never know whether you're the kingdom for such a time like this. But they expect you to do something. Or oh, hey, the Jews will be wiped out. And that constructive criticism made Esther to pronounce, I will go to the king. 
who have fast three days and three nights with me and the way. And you know, Mordecai went to fast. Esther went to fast. And because of that constructive decision, you are able to have a positive result. We need to ask a time with our children. Constructive criticism. That's why what me and people of us who are older now will laugh with our own father. Our own father would not know what we need today. He didn't sit us down most of the time. It's always one way, one way, one way direction. Have you done that? Have you done this? If you, if you delay like that, you are going to get some, some scolding immediately. You won't allow you to talk. Because there's no feedback between us and our parents. We should be better than our father and our grandfather by the grace of God. Constructive criticism. Number five, Philip's principle. We're looking at scriptures. As we look at definite prescription for children guidance development. What the principle of Philip in Act 21, verses 8 and 9. We'll so read this one. Very important because it has to do with four girls. And this man gave birth to. And what happened to those four girls? Act 21, verses 8 and verse 9. And the next day, we that were Paul's company departed and came unto Syria and were entered to the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, with deeds of the sound. There was closeness and companionship. Mommy and daddy, I am needed. The sisters need you too. All our children, they need us to be closer to them. To become a companion. The time comes in a child's life, it's not my child, you become your friend. You become your advisor. You become your good counselor. If you are truly raised your child up, the time comes, it will give you some wisdom, some wisdom, some advice that will be a blessing to your family. That's what you see here, Philip, his closeness and his companionship. Let's find the fact that he was an evangelist. We we'll find that he was successfully, he successfully raised uh, his four daughters to become prophetesses for God. They God raised our children of that way in Jesus' name. Number six, Solomon's principle. In Proverbs chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, hear the commandment of thy father. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. My son, or my daughter, what's that? Concentrated teachings. The principle we find from Solomon's life was a concentrated teaching. A kind of teaching that will not give up. In fact, he kept up from that chapter 2 of, of Proverbs up to chapter 8. My son, my son, my son, my son. Hear thou the instruction of thy father. Hear thou the, the fear of thy father. He all he was counseling and instructing and teaching his son. Our children need our teaching. In fact, we are the best teacher. Thank God for the teacher in school. But before they learn all the other things from all those teachers, let them learn morals from you. Let them learn righteousness from you. Let them learn the way of God from you. We see here concentrated teaching. Number seven is the recap principle. In Jeremiah 35, verse 5. That's commitment and continuity. Jeremiah chapter 35, verse 5. Jeremiah go to the house of this family. He invited them to the church, to the temple, to tenth day, to test day for their conviction, for their belief. He brought the time them to the house, he brought one before them, and those children said, no. Why? Our father of us. Where was your father? Your father at this time has died more than 200 years before at this time. But he kept on passing down that legacy of continuity. To their, to their children. They were committed to what their father told them. Is that what we find in the, in the world today? What you have told your children, are they living it out? That's a concern in the church of God today. What we have taught our children, when they go out there, would they practice those things you are teaching them? There's a break 
between us and them. There's a call. All what you are teaching has entered one ear and gone out. They are not following that principle. Not like these children of Rekha. After their grandfather died, their father died, these children said, Jeremiah, with due respect, our father taught us. We should not drink wine, we will not build anything, and we keep to that instruction and God bless them. If you read this passage, chapter 35 of Jeremiah, you see, we need to raise our children to follow that principle, record principle, commitment and continuity in the truth that God has done into our heart. Number, number eight, or number three. Number eight, Lois and Eunice principle. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible introduces us to three generations in this Bible. Lois was the grandmother. Eunice was the mother. Timothy was the grandson and the son. You find that principle that continues in this line. When I call to remembrance, your faith faith that is in me, which was which dwelt force in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and persuaded that indeed also you find conversion and service. They draw the feeling to the heart of Timothy. Serving God is not an option. Worshipping God is not whether you like it or not. The time was not get to your prayer that you feel, I've gotten all the wealth of this world, I don't need God in my life. The time must not come to your mind, you feel what? I'm settled and satisfied now, I don't need God in my life. He said, no, you saw it in your grandmother, you saw it in your mom. Timothy continued, and you know what? Timothy became a great bishop, a mighty bishop over the church of Ephesus at this time. A church of more than 50,000, as at this time, in, the, in Bible history. We need to know that what we teach our children, compassion, they introduced Jesus to Timothy, and Timothy accepted at the third day. Look at chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that for the child, there was no the holy scriptures. For the child, our children, they know knowledge. They know skills. They know animated pictures. You they know scriptures from a child. Listen to me. If our children, if you are born in Islam, will your children, what they know about Quran is what they will know now. Obviously, no. They will brainwash them, see them on the man, make them recite those things until it enters into their score. People know they may not know the truth of what they are saying. The point is, we Christians today are becoming flabby. Here we find a family that from a child that was known the Holy Scripture. Nathan dad and the iron dad and mom. You have the responsibility to raise this child to know the Holy Scripture. You know, most of the time, we give our children bad pump, we give them iPad, we give them iPhone, but we don't give them the Holy Bible. He said, you will tear the Holy Bible. Really? Really? You are not sincere. You didn't tear the iPad. You didn't tear the backpack. He will with this word. Then you buy another one, go buy ten Bibles. I think, brothers and sisters, we need to train our children in the way to read Bible, to recite Bible, to know Bible, because they are born as godly children to walk in the right path. And the Bible says, "There is no the Holy Scripture which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." Timothy knew the law because of the principle of loyalty and unity. That's conversion and service. We come to Abraham. Abraham and Sarah's principle, command and correction. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Genesis chapter 18, we read verse 19. The scripture revealed what God said concerning Abraham. In fact, in this passage, Abraham had not born, and Isaac was not born yet. Isaac was born in chapter 21. 
Ever before Isaac was born, God saw the heart of Abraham, the, the desire of Abraham. Look at what God said concerning him in Genesis 18, 19. For I know him, that's God talking about Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the will of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. He will command his children. You know what we do today? We appeal to our children. Serve God. Don't spoil my name. I beg you. You know? But here we find God using that powerful word, command. In other words, he will stand on the neck of that child to be what God wants him to be. To fulfill his divine pronouncement, command and correction. Children need us to correct them in love. And our correction should be commensurate to what the offense they have committed. We should not be classy with our children. Flip out with our children, carefree with our children, thinking they will outgrow wickedness. When they manifest it, we must learn to command our children to correct them in the right path with love. Number 10, Zechariah and Elizabeth principle. In reason, John the Baptist. Commitment. Oh, sorry, consecration. Consecration. They gave John the desire to consecrate his land to God to serve him. The father consecrated his life, the mother consecrated her life. John the Baptist grew up in that family of consecrated family couple and he consecrated his life for the service of the Lord. Luke 1, verse 12 to 17. Let's teach our children to be committed to God, to be consecrated to God. Let's teach I am. Luke that he will be more committed to God, yielded to God, serviceable to God. Number 11 is Asaph. Principle. Many people, for casual reader of the Bible, don't know this man. Asam. For our choir members, our brethren in choir, they know this man. The powerful man who brought all his children to continue in the legacy he began. You know what I learned from that? Creative legacy. In Asam principle, we read it because it's not a common passage. I beg your time today in 1 Chronicles chapter 25 in verse 1 and 2. 1 Chronicles chapter 25 verses 1 and 2. Moreover, David and the captain of the host separated to the service of the sons of Esau and of Aman and of Jephthah, who should prophesy with harps and psalteries with symbols. And the number of the workmen according to their service was of the sons of Asaph, Sankal and Joseph and Nathaniah, Azariah, the son of Asaph, under the hands of Asaph, which prophesied according to the order of the king. So go back to verse 17. Uh, verse 7. How many were they? They were 288 children. His children, his grandchildren, his great grandchildren, he built them to the core. Creative in singing. Look at verse 7. So the number of them were their brethren that were instructed in the sounds of the law, even all that were cunning was 200, four score, and eight. 288. Their father, he left a legacy for them. And those children just followed that line, serving God in the temple play on the instrument and they pass it down to their children. It became a generation, a continual legacy for the children of Israel. What's an example for us today? What's our children learning from us? Will they continue in the Bible if they are going to glory? The challenge for us is all of us here by his grave. Let's say God call up our soul. Our children are left behind. Will they continue to the church of the living God? That's the challenge we face in the world we live today. But we find Asam, he passed the test. By the grace of God, we will pass our test in Jesus' name. We find Joshua principle. Continue to serve the Lord. 
as 13, number 13, David's principle is the principle of conversation and compulsion to serve the Lord. Then Joseph and Mary's principle in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, is comprehensive training. Joseph and Mary, they trained Jesus in the way he should go. The Bible says Jesus grew up in stature, in favor with man and with God. Morally, he was trained. And academically, he was trained. Professionally, he was trained. In every sphere, even though he came as a son of God. You see, he still subjected, subjected himself to be trained. Brothers and sisters, God is telling us something. We need to train our children in the right path. That brings us to the good partnership for our children who are to me. The Bible says, Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Happy will you be? Happy shall your life be? Because God has used you to produce children to pull, to bring them to this world. May your joy know no bounds in Jesus' name. Next to our salvation and fear of God, our priority must be the spiritual and overall welfare of our children. We must give them time. Our devoted partnership as husband and wife results in the eventual dominion of our children later in life. For children to fulfill their callings and their destinies. We parents, husband and wife, this for you. This one about number one, we need Trinity presence. The presence of Trinity. In that Psalm 127 verse 1, except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain, the beauty. That is, iron and mommy, you need God's presence to build your home continually, to build your children continually. And every one of us together will need the Trinity, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to come to build our home and build our children in the right path. Trinity presence must be in our life. Number two, transform personalities. Our personality must be transformed. We need grace from God. We need redemption by the grace of God. We need forgiveness of our sins. If we cannot lead our children in the right path, we must be saved ourselves. These are days that you find parents who are smokers. They say, I don't want my daughter to come to become smoker. Fathers who are drug addicts, I don't want my son to, to end up like this. Mothers who are behind bars because of crime, I don't want my children to throw that line. It's not going to happen. Because the example you give that child, except there is a power that can stop that boy from going that, 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 that dangerous path. Our personality must be changed. We must receive pardon, forgiveness, grace by the grace of God, made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed by, by Calvary's blood before we can be able to influence our children in the right path. A good tree cannot bring forth evil tree. Neither can an evil tree bring forth good tree. Every tree will bring forth it by their fruit. You shall know that Jesus said, we need to understand, be saved, accepting Jesus into our life, accepting him as our Lord and Savior, turning away from our sin. It's not only a blessing for all, it's a blessing for the generation of our children coming. Because we see the difference in that, the impact of daddy and mommy's life, and that will rub on them to come to become what God wanted them to be. Number one, Trinity presence. Number two, transform personality. Number three, transparent piety. The kind of life we live that children knows we are, trans we are sincere to one another. Here yeah, we find couple today, they live in the same house, they drive the same car, maybe their job is back to back, not far away, the miles apart, but they are as far from one another that the north is far from the south pole. In their lifestyle, in their principles, in their ideas, in their plan for their future. How would that, ch that child be confused? Where well, will you teach his day? To the north, so hot, or to the south, so cold. Or to say in between, the bomb will slow, you will love him. You won't know where to go. That's why our transparent piety is not only for us, for our children, to see the innocence of that harmlessness of mom to see the way we respect and submit to one another 
that give an example to those children when later in life they get married. That picture will never leave their brain. It's important for us to know. Transparent by his If they are based in our life on hypocrisy, we're not sincere to one another. We're not pulling one another, we're just teasing one another. We're just roommate, but we're not, we're not couples. We're just house housemaid, but we're not couple, we're not God giving couple who knows one another, who desire one another. Those children can read it between the lines. And our piety, because it's not there, we rub on them. Transparent piety, number four, for our daily prayers. The time is gone, but you notice that we know that acting, family that prays together, stays together. With our children, they need prayer. We must pray. We must find time to pray with them. Not long, not a long hour, but moment we can pray. That we can pray and show so them in the power of God to guide them. Number five is training and teaching persistence. Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from him. Temptation will come. Something will want to sweep that child away. But because of your training that was persistent and practical, that child will follow that same way that God has used you to train them. I am depend on us, Daddy and And all our children depend on us to train them, to teach them on a persistent manner that by the grace of the Lord, they will come to become God one day to be. Number six is tenderness and Christ-like prudence. We need to be tender. Tenderness with one another, not harsh, not, not like a para kind of style of family life. The man roar like a lion, everybody must run for cover. No tenderness. Those children does not feel the tenderness of the dad, the tenderness of the mom, who end up on the street. That's why it's important. Our tenderness and Christ-like wisdom goes a long way to help our children, myself, and tireless perseverance. These are the, they are our ladies. I always tell people, all the money you make on earth, every house you have built on earth, and the father, I want BC, in Great Lakes, Silicon Valley, in California. Solomon said, ah, and I know that the child I give out to will eventually throw away everything at my legacy. Because it wasn't trained properly. And through his prophecy, the son that took over him, the kingdom became broken over him. Everything his father's labor for, everything washed down the throne. We cannot be too careful with our children. Tireless perseverance. Sometimes our children, they play pranks. They say, yeah, we're tired. But find a way to keep reaching them. Find a way to keep ministering to them. Find a way to keep communicating with them. Let it be an open-ended discussion that our children will be able to know what you are consistent, you are persevering, so that those children eventually after they grow older, they will know what you are telling them and fulfill it. And lastly, before we pray, to the triumphant pronouncement. I want you to read three passages because of my time. I want to warn everyone for all of their words on that word. Don't do what you are doing. You find that story in Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 to 29. Noah became drunk, then he slept in the open place naked. He had three children, he just escaped the flood with their wives. As their father was drunk, the youngest one, Ham, he saw his father. Instead of helping his father, he just started making jails. The senior ones shaved. And Japheth, they came to cover their father. Immediately, Lord woke up. Lord, Lord, before you open your mouth, what did you think first? Why am I lying down in the open field? Why did I go to my bedroom? Is, that, is it not my fault? Why did I drank those bottles before that I become tipsy? I can't see. I was seeing different molecules. I couldn't even know my way until I fall down here. And this guy came and he was just 
enjoy himself because he saw what he never saw before. You know what what God did? He just opened his mouth, then he placed a curse on that boy. And that boy would be a servant to the older two children. Triumphant pronouncement. Don't be like you. You are better off. But think about the pronouncement of Elkanah. In Luke 1 verse 67. After John the Baptist was born, he began to pronounce blessings upon John, upon his future, upon the children not yet of it was it was loaded. You need to understand God put something in our mouth as as spirit, as that amount. And this afternoon, you will exercise that authority upon every one of our children. There's a triumphant pronouncement that God wants us to offer. Well, let's read this one. It's in Genesis chapter 48, verse 14. Genesis 48, verse 14, 15, and 16. Genesis chapter 48, verses 14 down to 16. Is the pronouncement that God of to the mouth of this man of his children and grandchildren. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hand wittily. For Manasseh was the firstborn. Verse 15. And he blessed Joseph. And said, God, before my fathers Abraham, and I see did walk, that God would let me all my life long unto this day, the angel will redeem me from all evil. Bless the Lord. Let my name be name on day, and the name of my father Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. That's why Israel cannot be conquered today. The triumphant pronouncement, and this month, this afternoon, as a pastoral pronouncement over you. And God is saying, He will bless your life. Today, the first month, the first day of the month of July, greater will be your blessing. Greater will be the glory ahead of you. As we raise our children and walk in the way of the Lord, God is pronouncing this upon you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto thee. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you. Your amen is holy. I will give thee peace. He will give thee peace. The Lord will be gracious unto all. Let's rise up. We're closing our Bible. We're going to open our mouth first of all and begin to pronounce upon our children first of all. Anything you desire for your boy, for your son, open your mouth and pray. There's a triumphant pronouncement from the mouth of the saints. This afternoon, can you raise your voice and say, God, I bring my boy to you, mention his name. I bring my daughter before you, mention her name. God bless you. God bless her. God keep us. God uphold her. God sustain us. And our grandparents who are here, your children, God has blessed you with grandparents.